Welcome, everyone. We are here with Jamie Forbush, Education Director at Nature's Nursery in White House, Ohio. And today we're going to be talking with Jamie, and Jamie is going to be leading a presentation called Everyone Has Something to Give and What Do Birds Give? Uh, Jamie has been doing these wonderful programs uh, in conjunction with uh, Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society uh, during this month of November. Before we go on, I'd like to introduce you to Nature's Nursery's Building Fund. They are currently operating and have been operating out of a single residence family home with some other additional um, spaces that have been made in other parts of the property. They have just last week launched a brand new building fund. And as you can see from the slide on the viewer, it's quite a complex. But when you learn about all that they do and all of the counties that they service in Northwest Ohio, you'll understand why this new facility is so desperately needed. So I'm asking you to please donate to their building fund, and you can just go directly to naturesnursery.org, and that's N-A-T-U-R-E-S-N-U-R-S-E-R-Y.org. And please make a generous donation to their building fund. So as you can see from your next slide on the viewer, we've experienced all kinds of wonderful programs through the month of November. We begin with what nature's nursery gives, learning all about the facility and the service that it offers. We also then went on for the second week to discover what do mammals give, and Jamie hosted a beautiful program all about various mammals that are either in their care or in residence. And last week, uh, Jamie led what do reptiles and amphibians give? And this was really, really quite a program, uh, introducing us to snakes and box turtles and all kinds of amphibians and reptiles. And today, as I mentioned, I'd like to welcome you to what do birds give? Hello, so I'm Jamie, the Education Director here at Nature's Nursery, and this week I will be talking about what birds give. Um, and a new fun thing that just happened, uh, a couple of our ambassadors are off-site um, right now, uh, but our male black vulture that we've had for nine years, um, we even did a genetic test on him when he was, I think, four years old um, to figure out if he was male or female, and that's how he got his name, Ivan. Well, surprisingly, um, the day before Thanksgiving, uh, Ivan left us a present in his, um, in his nesting area. He laid an egg. Uh, so our black vulture that we thought was a male is actually a female, and I'm actually trying to preserve the egg right now. Um, it exploded a little bit. I did my best. It was my first time, but I can glue it back together. Um, so if you've ever seen or want to see a uh, black vulture egg, here it is. Um, this red is actually what the egg just looks like, so it has those speckles on it. Um, and people, a couple people were concerned it was blood, but it's not. It's just the way the egg looks. Um, so that was a very interesting surprise that we had. Um, so. That's going to kick off our whole uh, all about birds and what they give. So Ivan, he came to us. Uh, there was a gentleman from Tennessee who found Ivan in the road um, or somewhere. On the, I don't know where he found him, actually. Uh, but he found him. And in Tennessee, believe it or not, that uh, they actually can have these animals as pets there. Uh, but the gentleman moved to Ohio, and he did the right thing. He's like, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to have this bird here. And he wasn't, and so that's how we ended up with Ivan. Um, we actually had to teach him how to not eat canned cat food anymore, and um, we had to switch him over to rats, which I won't get into the details, but it was not a, it was not fun to do. Um, but now he eats, or I guess she eats, uh, lots of things now. Um, we have a couple of ambassadors that I wasn't able to bring over here today, 
Uh, we have a barred owl. Her name is Moon, so barred, B-A-R-R-E-D. Um, she came to us as an orphan. Uh, she was, I don't want to say imprinted, because we really did our best to teach her to be a wild owl. Um, we were very hands-off with her. But we even put her with other bar, baby barred owls, and she just didn't get it. She flew to us all the time. Um, so we couldn't release her into the wild. Um, and then we have Luther. He's a barn owl, B-A-R-N. Um, and he was purchased for us from the world, um, purchased from the World Bird Sanctuary uh, to kind of teach people about barn owls because in our area they've been extirpated, so they no longer exist here, but they exist elsewhere. Um, so we just kind of used him to kind of teach people about what what kind of species would still live here if their habitat was still here. Um, unfortunately, uh, their habitat made great farmland, and so uh, farmers came through, and that's why they're kind of called barn owls. They were found in people's barns. Um, and then we have uh, two other ambassadors across the world that I can't bring. Um, there's Kamali. She's a ancient red-tailed hawk. She's very old. Um, but she was actually a falconer's bird, um, and she got into an accident during one of our first flights. Um, she suffered severe head trauma, and she can't balance right anymore. Um, but she's lived a very, very long, happy life with us. And uh, Shiloh, we have a peregrine falcon um, who also is ancient. Um, all of our animals here tend to be a little on the geriatric side. They're very old um, and just aren't doing, I mean, they're doing fantastic still. It's just, they're too old where I don't feel comfortable taking them on programs anymore. So uh, Shiloh is across the road as well. Um, but peregrine falcons, if you know anything about peregrine falcons, they're very high-stress birds. Um, but hopefully I can get him back in the swing of things, and maybe I can start working with him more and getting him to trust people again. Um, it's been a while because he suffered some medical issues, and his wing had to be amputated even more than it already was. Um, but he's doing fantastic now. Where he's, He lets me get into his enclosure now without getting scared, so that's a big improvement. But I'll stop talking about the animals that you can't see and take you into the room behind me where we have tons of bird and avian friends all around, um, one is even walking around on the floor. I can hear him paddling around behind me. Um, so we'll get going. I do apologize for any kind of jostling that will be happening. Let me see if I can turn this camera around. There we go. All right. So I'm going to take you guys into this room here. And I'll take you to my first friend right here. So this is Boomer, and Boomer is a common nighthawk, and he is also, he's very, very old. He's almost 11 years old now, and uh, what's interesting, if you know anything about common nighthawks, is that they can only eat while flying. So for the past 10 years, we've had to feed Boomer by hand, and, uh, but he's doing very well. He's very spoiled. And uh, you can actually see his food here in the shot. And he came to us. He was, again, he was imprinted. Uh, we actually released him, and he came back. So that's why his name is Boomer. He's, it's short for Boomerang, um, because he just came back. Um, he came in as an orphan, and we raised him up. We've raised many, many Nighthawks. Um, but, yeah, he's the only one that came back to us. Um, she's actually one of the ambass few ambassadors we could take outside and actually let fly around um, outside. And when he was done flying, what he would do is he would land on the ground and uh, chirp for us to come pick him up. Uh, so, he's, uh, so, Jamie, I, I want to ask you, um, when you say you have to feed him by hand, um, and then if you have other night hawks <laughs> come in, but you say that they feed uh, in flight, uh, mm -hmm. how do you manage that for each each bird? Yep, uh, we have to hand feed every single one that comes in. Um, so we usually use tongs, we usually don't use our fingers to feed. Um, and so that kind of keeps them desensitized to humans. We don't want them to think our hands mean food. And so we use tongs to feed them, sometimes we'll wear gloves, um, things to make our hands not look like hands. Um, and that'll kind of teach them how to, the proper ways to eat food. It's especially hard for young ones. Luckily, animals just have an innate sense of knowing how to do things. 
which makes our lives a lot easier, especially for these wild guys. So let me see if I can, maybe he'll want to eat. You can see his giant mouth. Can you eat? No. Not right now. No. Sometimes we have to play airplane with him. <laughs> Just for your, uh, your own kids. He's been stubborn lately. He doesn't, he'll go on and off when he wants to eat. Oh, he's very <laughs> handsome. Yes. And the best thing about these birds, in the wild, you know, they're insectivores. So they're going to eat tons and tons of insects. And the coolest thing are, is that a lot of people don't realize that these birds live right around you. They don't know these exist because they're nocturnal birds. And they generally, in our area, they've learned how to nest on top of roofs. So they'll nest on top of, like, universities, McDonald's, big box stores that have really large, flat roofs. Wow. It's great for eggs because there are really no predators up there. Mm. So you can definitely, he's not making his noise. Sometimes he's very chatty. Um, today, not so much. But uh, you can definitely, if you're outside at night in the spring and summer, you can hear these guys. They make a nice little chirp noise and that's very, very distinctive. Well, we'll be sure to look for those in our neighborhoods. Definitely. Here's a little terror. Hi, Mary Lou. Is this scary? I'm going to open it there. Mary Lou. So this is Mary Lou. She gets excited when she's around people. She's also nervous because this is a big camera, or the camera stand here is, I think, is making her a little nervous. Uh, but Mary Lou, she is a, an American crow. And she came to us about four years ago as an orphan. Uh, she was actually injured, so she has a leg injury. And she never quite learned how to fly. And because of that, we couldn't release her. If a bird can't fly, we can't release it. Uh, but we were able to release her sibling. Uh, Mary Lou, though, um, crows do that with their toes. They like picking their toes for some reason. <laughs> um, but Mary Lou, she just for some reason never learned how to fly until maybe a year later after she already we already imprinted her. Um, so she'll be with us for the rest of her life and crows can live an incredibly long lifespan in captivity. Um, our other crow, his name is Jackson, he lived to be 30. Um, but he had plenty, he had, he had so many medical issues from his life before us. Oh. And um, the oldest crow that I know of right now lives in New York City and that's 59 years old. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So she has a long life, we hope, with us. Mm -hmm. Right, Mary Lou? She's such a stinker. So I'm working on training her right now. Um, she comes to my arm. Um, I've actually started touching her toes. So when we do nail trims on her, she'll just give me her foot and we can trim it. <laughs> so it's less stressful for her and less stressful on us as well if she's willing to get it done. She does anything for treats. Now, but, now, will you, you uh, use her in educational programs? And how many educational mm -hmm. programs, uh, in, in not in a co the COVID world, but mm -hmm. traditionally, how many educational programs do you do with the animals every year? Yes. So Mary Lou, she's a newer bird. Uh, she's so intelligence in birds makes them very afraid of things. And so it's very hard. Any new thing, even if it's a paper, new paper towel roll, we have a new toy over there on the wall. I don't know if you can see it. It's attached to a stick. Um, see, see, she's afraid of everything. I got a little too close for her, and she started jumping back and forth. Um, but she won't go any, on any programs until we can get her more accustomed uh, to being around people and seeing new people and seeing new things, um, which probably won't happen until we are at the next facility. But generally, uh, I go on about 300 programs a year, I'm taking all of our ambassadors with us, um, or not all of them, but like a variation, usually two or three at a time, um, with breaks in between. But yeah, 300 programs. So I'm going to shut the door. This camera is making her very nervous, which is funny because it's not like we haven't had this in here before. And then our next little friend. So it might be kind of hard to see them. So over here we have two barn swallows. 
um, little tiny birds, but their names are Popper and Lou. Um, so Lou is another situation. We thought Lou was a girl because he didn't get his male plumage until um, a couple years later. Um, so Lou, or it was Lucy, who is now Lou. Um, he's or he's the one. Okay, so he's the one up here, up higher, and then Popper is the one below. And Popper has been with, with us for 11 years. And uh, Popper came to us uh, with a wing injury. And he had unfortunately um, been unable to be released because uh, that wing injury prevents him from flying south for the winter. So just like uh, Boomer the Nighthawk, he's, these birds are also insectivores. And so if they can't fly, we cannot release them because they can't migrate. Uh, Lou was with us because he um, came covered in oil, and uh, we cleaned him up, did everything we could. Um, he's fine health-wise, but his, he flies in circles, um, little tiny circles, over and over and over again. Um, when he try, when he gets nervous or scared, um, he can't fly in any kind of straight line. Uh, and we don't know if that's because of something to do with the oil, or we're not sure if it's a neurological thing. Um, but unfortunately, he did fine in here. It's just he will he wouldn't survive a few minutes outside. Wow. Now, Jamie, I know you're a stickler for numbers. So <laughs> can you help us to understand um, out of the resident birds that you have, um, are you able to tell us about how many volunteers or volunteer hours it takes uh, to care for these birds every week or month or or what whatever the uh, time frame is. So if they're just cleaning cages and not doing anything else, not doing enrichment, not doing anything um, like cleaning the floors and all that, if we just focus on how long it takes them to clean all of the cages, it probably takes about two hours. Um, with everything else involved, it's probably four hours a day. Um, to care for all of the animals that we have here. And that's just doing the basic cleaning and not doing any extra stuff. Um, so about four hours every, so, every every day, all year, 365 days a year. We're, right. we, don't, we, we can't take a day off. There's always somebody here at the center. Um, we do leave at night, though, so we do sleep. But we're, we're here a lot. <laughs> that's quite a commitment. It is, but it's definitely worth it seeing these guys, especially when you know that you're either help, helping ease their suffering or seeing that moment where you're finally able to release them into the wild, which is fantastic. Unfortunately, these guys won't go back out into the wild ever, but they at least get the experience of teaching people about their species. So maybe we can help more of their species in the long run. So down here we have Einstein. He's kind of uh, what we call the golden child um, because he he's perfect and in every way, right, Einstein? He knows. He knows he's perfect. Um, but uh, he's just like the sweetheart of nature's nursery. Um, he came to us as an orphan, um, but unfortunately, he was he was so young. Um, probably not even a week old when he came to us. Uh, it was a really stormy day. His tree fell down. He was the only survivor of that fall, um, and he did suffer some severe head trauma and I believe an injury as well, um, and he had to be force fed for five weeks, which means we had to hold him in our hands and shove food down his little mouth um, because he wouldn't do it himself. And so because of that, um, he just got way too used to people. Um, so we did save him, and there's nothing wrong with him now, except for the fact that he thinks he's a person. Um, so we cannot release him. He's been with us um, 10 years, or 11 years now, actually. And uh, Einstein, uh, he's actually afraid of live food. So if we released him into the wild, he would starve. Um, if he sees anything like a mouse, he actually gets scared of it and will fly away from it. Um, which is the exact opposite of what we needed him to do. Um, and so here he lives happily with us. He gets his window view um, and he gets tons of attention every single day. People love him. And he's a great, absolutely great little um, 
ambassador. We take him on so many programs. Actually, I would say between him and our other Screech Owl, um, Serafina, I think each of them go on about 60 programs a year. Oh, my goodness. Oh. And they must be very popular. Oh, yes. Incredibly popular. Now, can you tell us about the little structure that's inside his his cage? And, yeah. Um, yeah, please. What is that made of and what is it for? So that little structure is actually a hide box. Um, we give it to him so maybe if he doesn't want to see people or be around people, um, he can get away from it. If something outside scares him, he can get away from it. Um, we do move it around his cage to kind of give him different opportunities, different with flight patterns to go inside of it. Um, on top of it, we have, you might see this in a lot of cages, it's called daisy mat. It's that blue material you saw in Mary Lou's cage and in Boomer's cage as well. Um, birds in captivity, if they, and even in the wild, if they sit on the same spot and get the same texture multiple, multiple days in a row, um, they end up with a sores called bumble. Um, and they develop, or like, kind of like bed sores. But for them, it's bumblefoot. Um, and it's these sores that they get on their feet. It makes it hurt, it hurts stand. Um, so we offer this daisy mat, which gives them different textures all of the time. It's really, I say, the best thing for birds and their feet, um, just giving them different textures. Even if you have, like, your own captive birds, so like parrots, um, parakeets, giving them those different textures really help out their feet. Especially if they're an animal like Boomer who has to sit on his feet all day, he can't really fly. Um, so he's sitting on his feet all the time, and so we have to offer different textures in order for him, his feet not to get sore. Wow. Well, you, you also you mentioned enrichment. Can you talk a little bit about what that is? You mean you just don't leave the birds all day and or if they go out for educational sessions and sort of be done with it? How does it work? Yeah, so enrichment is something I'm building right now. Um, I'm trying different things to see what works best for us. Um, and I might have come up with a way that will work well. Um, but basically, enrichment, I think, is the best thing. Is you, it's a must. If you have any kind of pet um, at home, even your own pets, your dogs, your cats, um, parrots, your even your turtles, your tortoises, your snakes, um, enrichment is very important for their health. Um, for either for their brain activity, for different experiencing new things, uh, making them not so afraid of everything. Um, so, like uh, for Einstein, we'll add in uh, fake plants, we'll add in real plants. Um, birds do smell. Um, surprisingly, a lot of people think they don't, but they do have an olfactory gland. They can smell. Um, so we will offer different types of scents. Um, we'll play music so they can hear different things. Um, just uh, really anything that invokes their senses um, will make it hard to get food because in captivity, um, somebody explained it to me, uh, you know, your dog eats its food in 15 minutes in the wild. They would spend all day doing that if your dog existed in the wild. So um, for our animals, we make it a little bit tougher. These birds in the wild will sit all day waiting for food. And here, we give them their food. It's not running away from them. They just go down to wherever it is. They eat it. What are they going to do the rest of the day? So we offer these different enrichment opportunities so they spend their days doing other things. It's even more, it's just so important. I can't express how important enrichment is to the health of any animal that you have. Well, that sounds like an entire whole different realm of care. Oh, yeah. And like Einstein, the perch he's on right now actually swings. And so when he lands on it, it swings back and forth. So he has to use his muscles and learn how to balance on the swing as it moves. And we'll try to do that with any of the birds that are flighted. Um, we don't offer the swinging perch to birds who are not because we don't want them to hurt themselves. And that's kind of also with enrichment. Not only do you have to make sure it's um, healthy and stimulating for them, but also that it also doesn't cause harm as well. Now, for, for, the, for the birds, do you um, have the ability or, or do, you, do the, you take them to other sized uh, cages, uh, like to fly or to just be in a larger space? How do you, is that important and how do you manage it? Yeah, it's very important depending on the animal. 
some animals it can do the opposite. It can cause them too much distress. So like Mary Lou uh, is hard pressed getting her out of her cage even. She doesn't like flying around the room at all. Um, I've tried many times. I can get her to fly to my arm, but the second I even take one little step backwards to bring her out of her cage, she bolts back in. Um, with Einstein, uh, he doesn't really benefit from it as much because he just likes sitting on, he just flies to a spot and just sits there. Usually it's on a computer, so he'll sit on top of a computer and just sit there um, until you put him back. Um, but other birds, like um, we ha Mary Lou, she did benefit it from it at one point when she wasn't afraid. I'm not sure what made her afraid of coming out. Um, but she would fly from cage to cage. She would experience it. And um, we have a duck wandering around somewhere. Um, it's his turn. He usually gets the freedom of the room because he's the only one who's really brave enough to venture around anywhere. So he's walking around. I can hear his feet somewhere. Um, so he kind of explores the room. He was outside. Um, like during summer, we take him outside to a pool. Um, he gets to swim around. Um, we have a couple of raptors inside raptors that we have outdoor caging so if we wanted to take Einstein outside we could. Um, same thing with Mary Lou if he wasn't terri if she wasn't terrified of being outside of her cage we could take her outside um, which I'm hoping to do soon. So we moved her in front of a window um, in hopes that maybe that will get her used to the sight of outside so we could take her outside um, next summer ideally, next spring or summer when it gets a little bit warmer out. Um, that way she gets that nice UV light. UV light is important for birds. You might see it with Einstein there. Um, we actually have a rotation. Um, UV light, just like with reptiles, is incredibly important for birds and their health as well. So we have a rotation for that too. Oh, the care is very comprehensive. There's our duck. Oh, how wonderful. So we call him our house duck. He made poor decisions, and that's why he's inside. So that's Martin, and there goes Martin. <laughs> he doesn't like new things either. Um, but Martin, uh, he actually has angel wings. I don't think he's he's on his way begging for more food. There he is. He's on the floor down there begging for mealworms from one of our volunteers. <laughs> um, but he has angel wing, and angel wing is. Um, basically what happened to him is he was fed an improper diet when he was young and his I don't, I don't really know how to describe angeling because I don't quite understand it fully myself um, but from my understanding is that it almost twists the bone which twists the feathers as well and it prevents him from flying and so he unfortunately cannot be released we have another duck outside also with angeling and adults can develop it as well. I saw that, giving him more treats. <laughs> um, and uh, so he actually made poor decision outside. So he was outside with another duck and a double crested cormorant. And uh, we either think he's either really smart or really dumb. So just c during winter, um, he ended up pulling the tail feathers of the double crested cormorant, um, which have very sharp beaks. And um, she bit him right across the bill, and he had to come inside for medical care. Um, and then he healed up all winter long in here. And in the springtime of the following year, we took him back outside. Um, and he was happy all summer. They were all content um, until winter hit again. And lo and behold, this little duck decided to pull out the double-crested cormorant's tail feathers again. Um, and uh, once again, she finally had enough and she ended up biting him across the beak again where he, so he came back inside for medical care and he just kind of stayed inside because at that point he, we think he's either really smart and figures out he doesn't like the cold so he's inside <laughs> or it's the other way around and he just doesn't, he just likes, he's a bully and he likes picking on animals. Um, but he's 10 years old so uh, actually he uh, lived outside with this double crested cormorant. Mary Lou doesn't have attention. That's why she's climbing right now. She's like, come back to me. Um, but uh, he lived with this other, this other mallard duck and the double crested cormorant for eight years before he did this. So they, we, they did live happily together. And um, I actually take him on programs now. Uh, I've trained him to go to a daisy mat that I have on the floor right here. Let me see if I can get it in the shot. 
There it is. So that's a daisy mat right there. And uh, I've actually trained him to come to it. And I've trained him to go into his crate when asked. Oh, there he goes right now. There we go. He knows he's getting treats. So he only gets treats when he's on this mat, right, Kathy? Correct. When he's on this mat only. <laughs> really? And um, <laughs> so he only gets treats when he's on this mat now. Um, he's very food motivated. And so when I take him on a program, what I do is I set this mat in front of his crate, open the crate door, he walks to the mat, he knows if he stands on the mat, he gets treats. Um, so who says you can't teach an old duck, right, Martin? <laughs> and what is he eating right now? He loves mealworms. He'll do anything for a mealworm, as you can tell. He's probably she's trying to tear apart the mat to get through one that crawled probably in the little crack. <laughs> and right here, we put his mat next to his favorite pal. There's a bunny inside that tube. I think you met Roman a couple weeks ago. Yes. Um, Martin and Roman have an interesting relationship. Martin will stand here and wait for Roman to come out and eat his food, and then I'll try to poke him in the butt. <laughs> so they're the best of friends. Ducks and bunnies, they always love each other. Well, I don't know if it's because they love to annoy each other, really. I think that's what it is. They like to annoy each other. <laughs> but I think you can kind of see his angel wing. His wing sticks out just a little bit. Yes, we can okay. see that. Okay. Yeah. So basically what happened there is his wing twisted a little bit. Um, and because of that, he can no longer fly. Uh, well, he can't fly into this cage, though, because I have seen him in there eating Roman's food. Oh. <laughs> he definitely does like antagonizing the bunny. And then in here, we have another ambassador. Might be kind of starting, hard to see her because it's dark. Let me see if she'll let me lighten it up a little bit. And so all of our birds have covers on them to make them feel more secure. And also, um, like if Mary loses out of her cage and lands on top of it, uh, she doesn't poke Serafina here. Um, so Serafina, she's an eastern screech owl, just like Einstein, but she's a red morph. Might be kind of hard to see her with the bars. Um, Serafina was actually found at a railroad station, and uh, she was missing a wing completely when she came to us, so it was already amputated, um, so unfortunately she cannot fly, and so she will live with us for the rest of her life. If you noticed Einstein's behavior compared to hers, um, Einstein was really fluffed up, and he was comfortable around us. Serafina, I love showing as the opposite because she came to us as an adult. We don't know how old she actually is, um, but she's been with us for nine years. Um, she's never, she doesn't quite trust us, though I do think she does like head scratches sometimes. Um, but for the most part, uh, these animals are wild. They do not like being touched. And uh, Serafina is a very, yes, Mary Lou, I hear you. Um, Serafina, she, she's never going to be truly comfortable with us, I don't think. She's been with us for nine years, but you notice her ear tufts are straight up in the air. She's very squinty. She's watchful of us. Um, if I tried opening her cage door, she would display uh, the typical uh, behaviors of owls, this where they rock side to side and they're fluffed up and they're clacking their beaks. Um, but... She does well on programs. She does fantastic. She'll just step up right on my hand, um, and she'll sit there the entire program until I put her back. So um, because of that, we decided to keep her. If she didn't do that, if she was so terrified, um, we wouldn't have her on a program. We would have euthanized her to, for her health. Um, but because she's comfortable with us, um, she's, I would say she has a good life. She gets food. She's eating. So she, I think she's happy here. Um, so she'll live with us until she passes away, which hopefully won't be anytime soon. <laughs> well, she must be she must be a really great asset um, for you on programs. As we look through the bars, we can see her. She she looks so she must be so pretty. Oh, she's beautiful. She's uh, she's actually my screensaver. <laughs> oh, she's so pretty. Her feathers, everything about her. 
her, her, she's so sassy. She has such a personality. She's great. So I'm going to move this her cover back without scaring her. There we go. And I have two more ambassador friends over here. I'm saving one of the most unique for last. Right, Carl? So in here we have Jefferson, the American Kestrel. And Jefferson came to us, I would say, five years ago. No, four years ago now. And he came to us. His nest actually fell out of a gargoyle on Jefferson Avenue in Toledo. And we were able to release his sibling. But Jefferson is very particular. Um, these, uh, well, his species is particular. Um, American Kestrels need to be at 100% in order to be released. If they're not at 100%, they're not going to be able to catch their prey. And so Jefferson, he has trouble catching live food. And because of that, we couldn't release him. But he's fully flighted. He's just not fast enough. He can't do the sharp turns quick enough to catch food. And so that's why he's here. Um, he is slowly undergoing training to take him on programs. Um, he doesn't like it very much. He does fine. Uh, he'll sit on my glove, but to get him to sit on my glove, it's a whole rigmarole to catch him up. He does not like that. Um, but uh, these birds are so smart. So he knows that if I scare him or he's nervous in any way, he'll fly to this white perch here in the corner. You can kind of see it back there. Um, that's his go-away perch. So he knows that if... Um, I'm in his cage, and he doesn't like it. He'll fly there to basically tell me to get out. And so <laughs> immediately that our training session is over because I'm not going to get anywhere. He's on his go-away perch. He wants me to leave. Um, so we kind of have trained our birds to know, um, to have a choices. So he can choose, and it, we think it empowers them to be able to choose if they want us in their cage or not. Um, with him, though... Even if you open his cage door, he'll immediately usually fly to that perch, um, tell you to go away, but we have to clean it. So sometimes we do ignore it, um, but that's for his health. Um, other times, though, like with training or with enrichment, if we open the door and he immediately flies to that perch, I back out. Well, his, but, his markings and coloring are so beautiful. Oh, yes. So they're one of the... They're uh, one of the sexually dimorphic species, so you can tell the difference between a male and a female American kestrel. Uh, males have those spots on their wings um, and tend to be more blue. They have more of the blue color, where females, I find, have more of the red color, and they actually have bars across their feathers instead of spots. Mm. But he's a great little bird. He, usually, so... Because I have the camera here, he's in back, but this front perch right here is his um, kind of come-in perch. You can come in. I'm curious. I, you're okay to come in. Um, and he actually will sit there and loves watching people. He adores it. Um, I actually removed this perch once just to see if that was the case, and he was not happy. He kept flying to here because he knew that's where his perch was supposed to be, so he'd fly and actually hang from the bars up here. Um, so eventually we put it back in. I just wanted to know if that's truly what it was. He's a very handsome bird. And then our last special creature, and our last special bird friend that we have inside. Do you know what kind of bird that is, Betsy? The bird looks familiar. Can you give us some clues? He's very common. I'm sure you guys know what it is. Is that a cardinal? It's a cardinal. Yeah. He's, he's beautiful. Yeah. So this is Carl, the albino cardinal. Um, we got him as a little white fluff ball. Um, quite literally, he was a little white fluff ball. You couldn't even totally tell him. Like, if you got a picture of him, he just looked like a cotton ball. Um, but uh, we got him because he was caught by a dog. Um, and we were we could have relate, re released him if he wasn't um, suffering from seizures due to his albinism traits, and he can't see very well either. You'll notice he will kind of bob his head back and forth trying to focus. Um, so at Nature's Nursery, we do receive, like we get 
albino animals more than you think. So we get, uh, we've had an albino skunk, a couple albino squirrels, um, and we've released them. But with Carl, it's a little bit different because he does need to be on daily medication in order to prevent the seizures. And he very clearly does not see well at all. Um, I'll train him. So I've, he's actually trained to step up onto my hand. Um, and I don't know if you've ever been bit by a cardinal, but it hurts quite a bit. Um, and with, because uh, their beaks are made for cracking seeds. But with Carl, um, he'll actually kind of mouth my finger to know where my finger is before he steps up onto it, um, which I'm glad for because if he bit, um, I definitely would be having him step up onto a stick instead. But and how long has Carl been with you? Uh, I think he's been with us two years now. Okay. Two years? Yeah. yeah. Two years. Mm -hmm. But So he's still a little guy. Um, he does, um, during springtime, he will flirt with the humans. So he will dance back and forth across the bottom of his cage, fluffing up his wings and fluttering them. Um, same thing with Einstein, the screech owl. He'll do it too um, come spring. He'll try to attract the female humans. Or not, I don't even know if it's all females. It could be males too. Anybody who gives them attention, they'll try to attract. Um, but he'll really get into a mood. He'll start whistling and it's very cute. Um, what's funny is that Carl made all sorts of weird noises because he was never around cardinals. Until we got a cardinal upstairs in rehab, he must have been able to hear him, and now Carl makes the cardinal noise, or the cardinal songs. Well, that's fascinating. Yeah. So he recognized that that was his species, and he mimics it. Um, before that, he sounded like almost like a, a laser gun, right. if you can imagine that. So he, like the pew, pew, pew noise, that's what he would do. Um, it was very funny, and he still does it. Um, just not as much since you learned how to sing like a cardinal. <laughs> but, hi buddy, he's very curious. So that is the last of all of our bird ambassadors that I have inside. And all of these birds, they truly do wonderful things for the environment. Not just for humans, but for other species as well. They eat and keep insect populations down. Uh, they catch rodents. They keep the rodent population in check. If there were too many rodents, the rodents would eat all of the food that might be for squirrels or for other animals. So having raptors like Jefferson, um, even Mary Lou, she will, she's an omnivore, so she consumes uh, rodents as well. Typically, they're more scavengers, so they eat the dead things. But they prevent that dead thing from rotting on the ground, attracting flies, the diseases, all sorts of things. And the birds are just truly incredible. And they are a good species to tell about climate change, so, or are affected by it. I mean, uh, barn swallows and other birds that are similar to them, they migrate based on um, the celestial cycle. It's not anything to do with what's on Earth. They're following the sun and the moon. But with climate change, that affects that cycle. So, or it's, it's, it functions independent of the celestial cycle. So the birds follow that cycle, and they know when it's going to get warm. They know that if, I, okay, if I leave at this time, when I arrive to my final destination, there's going to be food there. But with climate change, with things... Um, blooming earlier with eggs hatching earlier when they're arriving the food's already hatched and dissipated or has been consumed by local predators so when the migratory birds get here that food's gone and they have to fight and their populations decrease because they're fighting over territory they're fighting over food sources um, what little food sources remained especially if you have also uh, habitat destruction like with the barn owls they don't have a habitat here anymore. Where there used to be long, tall grass prairies, there's now farmland. So, are, are you seeing any, any, um, what kind of complications are you noticing in um, 
the animals that come to you, perhaps mm -hmm. as a result of changes in the climate. Are you able to, to uh, I, because it's on such a long timeline, but however there can be bursts of, of climate change, the effects of climate change, have you at the center noticed the effects of climate change on your, your, the animals you care for? That's a good question. I would say no because there are so many other factors and a lot of the times the reason the animals come to our center are because of some kind of human impact to the environment. But every year sometimes we'll have more animals than before. So like this year, we call it the year of the raptor. We had probably almost a hundred more raptors than we have in previous years. Wow. And even if you account for how, yes, this year we did take in almost 600, 800 animals than we took in the year before, even if you account for that in the numbers, that was still a lot of raptors. Uh, one year we had a lot of opossums. So maybe that could be an environmental, so that maybe it was affected because of climate change. Um, maybe the previous year, maybe there wasn't, it wasn't a good year for um, some kind of bird last year. So this year we won't see very many of them coming at the center, which is a good thing. But mm -hmm. maybe it's a bad thing because at the center I feel we get 900 bunnies a year. They're animals that you see all of the time. My but, goodness. Yeah, so that's a typical a year for bunnies, about 900. Um, mm -hmm. But say we take in 800 opossums. Well, maybe the year before, so last year, maybe last year was a really good year for them, but now this year it isn't, so we're seeing fewer than we normally would. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they're getting picked off by other animals because, you know, whatever reason. There's so many different things that go into why we have animals. I wouldn't say it's just one thing, like climate change or even human disturbances. It's more of just there's so many different factors. I don't even know how to describe it. Yeah. But well, it's a complicated ecosystem. Yeah. It's very complicated. Um, but sometimes we can pinpoint more issues. Like um, earlier this year, we had a whole bunch of seizing Cooper's hawks. Um, and so we investigated it a little bit more. We noticed they were all coming from a, a couple of zip codes. And then we dug a little bit more and found out that um, there was a lot of construction oh. in that area. And with a lot of construction, you're disturbing rats' nests. And so rats were more prevalent and people were putting out more poison. Oh. Their, the Cooper's hawks were ingesting things like arsenic and causing um, them to seize. So sometimes if we do some tracing like that, if we're seeing something odd, we can trace it back and figure out what it is. Um, but a lot of the times we can't. Uh, right now we have um, something that might be going around with yeast. Their crops are being impacted. We don't know if that's just a weird coincidence that multiple geese came in with it this year, or maybe there's something wrong. We're not sure. So we have to do more investigation with that, and we'll see. But... Well, right I now, just question. To be I have a question for you. With with all of this, um, how do the rehabilitation centers uh, work together? How do you collaborate to compare compare um, you know it, uh, disease and species mm -hmm. and change? Yeah. So we do collaborate with a couple other nature centers. We'll ask around, um, especially. Um, well, we'll usually talk to people we know specifically at the other centers. We'll reach out to them individually. Uh, but sometimes that we usually have a yearly conference uh, where we'll, all of the rehabilitation centers in Ohio will meet and we'll discuss issues. Um, earlier this year, a couple actually a couple weeks ago, um, when we were going and touring nature centers um, in southern Ohio, we noticed another nature center that also was having seizing Cooper hawks. Um, and so we gave them advice on how to um, kind of track down and see what could have been causing it. Um, and just thing, things of that nature. If we're, if we're noticing trends, we'll reach out to other major centers who very willingly will give up um, whatever information that they have 
on whatever species of bird it is or animal, mammal. doesn't necessarily have to be birds. Usually we see it in birds more, but it could be mammal too. Hmm. Well, that's fascinating. Well, thank you so much, Jamie, for showing us how birds matter today. Yeah, they're incredibly important. Aren't you, Carl? Hi. No? This has been very <laughs> informative. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad it was informative, and I hope it was. A I was able to teach people a little bit about animals and their species and why we have them. And if you notice through all of them, usually it's sometimes pure accidental, like with Jefferson and his nest just happen happening uh, to fall out of the tree. But a lot of the times it's because of human interaction. Um, some things are inevitable, like we can't stop a train from hitting a bird or the bird from hitting the train. Uh, but with Carl, he got attacked by a dog. We, maybe if we teach people more about that, people will understand, okay, you know, it's springtime, there's baby animals around, maybe I should check my backyard for, you know, X baby animal that could be crawling on the ground before I let my dogs out. Um, so hopefully it teaches people a little bit and they learn more. That's all we can really do, right? Learn more exactly. about healthy animals. That's very wonderful. Well, thank you, Jamie. You're, you yourself are quite an ambassador, and we've learned so much this month. Um, before we close, I want to go back just for a second and take a look at some of information that we have about the new building fund. Nature's Nursery has now opened up a wonderful building fund, and you can see from the slide on your screen this is the proposed uh, draft and the proposed construction, uh, providing them with the adequate space that they need to do the work that they do. As you know, they know, uh, not only provide rehabilitation services, but they also do extensive educational programs uh, throughout the Northwest Ohio area. Many, many programs. And we have uh, Jamie Forbush, who's the Director of Education at the Center, who we've been very fortunate to uh, learn from from this month. So I'm encouraging everyone to please make a donation to naturesnursery.org. And I'm going to switch to another slide to show you um, exactly where you can give. You can make a donation in any amount uh, to Nature's Nursery at naturesnursery.org, N-A-T-U-R-E-S-N-U-R-S-E-R-Y.org. Or if you'd prefer to send a check, you can mail a check to Nature's Nursery at Post Office Box 2395 White House, Ohio, 43571. And we'll also encourage you not only to go to naturesnursery.org website to learn so much more about this wonderful center, but also to go and visit a Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society's uh, website, uh, wcaudubon, A-U-D-U-B-O-N.org, uh, and search that website and you'll find lots of lots and lots of information about nature's nursery. So thank you once again, everyone, for participating. And uh, we are delighted that you could join us today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can give a face-to-face a -face goodbye. And thank you to Jamie. And thank you for everything. And folks, Send a check, send a donation, donate to their wonderful new building fund. Thank you. Thank you.